Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Vice President, General Manager of the Processor and Physical IP Divisions, Arm Simon Seagar. Good morning, and welcome back to uh, TechCon. Welcome to day two. Uh, yesterday was all about chip implementation, and uh, today, and for the rest of the conference, uh, we're going to change uh, change focus and talk about software and systems design. Now, particularly, uh, as we talked about yesterday, low power really is at the, the heart of everything that we're doing and is uh, a, an area that we need to continue work on uh, as we develop the next generation of, of technology. So this morning's keynote speakers are going to reinforce those themes and, and talk about them uh, from various different uh, dimensions. Our first speaker this morning has spent his career studying low power design and studying innovation and the way that companies uh, address these issues and analyzing this with empirical data. So it should be a really interesting talk. Our first speaker is uh, Jonathan Kumi, and he is a consulting professor with Stanford University. Spent a, a long career in academia, uh, having been with uh, various academic institutions such as uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, Yale University, and UC Berkeley's um, Energy, and uh, sorry, Energy and Resources Group. Very well uh, qualified guy to talk about this uh, subject. He's got uh, MS and PhDs uh, from the Energy Resor Resources Group at UC Berkeley and an AB in uh, History of Science from Harvard. Um, he's also a very uh, well-published author. He's been the author or co-author of nine books and more than 150 articles and papers. And he's one of the uh, leading international experts on the eco economics of reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, and the effects of information technology on resource use. So I think it's going to be really interesting. I was talking yesterday about how with the, the growth of the world's population, this is placing great strain on the world's resources, uh, and Jonathan's been studying this. So I think he's going to have some great things to say. Um, if you want to read more about him afterwards, uh, he's, as I said, got many books. Uh, he's recently authored a book called Turning Numbers into Knowledge, Mastering the Art of Problem Solving. Uh, that's been translated into many languages, uh, Chinese, Italian, and soon Korean. Uh, and there's a theme there for later on. Uh, and also cold cash, cool climate, science-based advice for uh, ecological entrepreneurs. So I think he's going to have a lot to uh, tell us about, uh, which is going to be highly relevant to everything that uh, the ARM partnership is doing. So with that, let me welcome to the stage uh, Jonathan Cooper. Thank So in the technology industry, there's always a lot of loose talk about revolutionary change. But I'm convinced that we're on the cusp of a revolution worthy of the name. And it's one that will fundamentally alter the way we understand and respond to the world around us. Now, in the old days, the very best computer scientists and engineers would focus on building the biggest supercomputer or the fastest PC. But there's a new game in town, and some of that talent is now being turned towards a different kind of computing challenge. And that talent is you, the people in this room. That new computing challenge is one that, in performance terms, is really no comparison to the supercomputers or to the fastest PCs, but that these computing devices have different benefits. So number one, they're cheap, so we can build a lot of them. Number two, they're smart, so they can help us make better decisions. Number three, they're tiny, so we can put them in places that we could never have imagined putting computers before. They're also connected, so they can, via wireless, bring information to the cloud, and we can then use that information to act upon and make better decisions. Finally, uh, they're low power, ultra low power in most cases. And that means battery lives that, la that are you know, in, measured in years or decades. Uh, and in some cases, uh, so low power that they can scavenge the energy they need from ambient energy flows of light, heat, motion, or even straight radio and television signals. So let me give you one example to whet your appetite. I'll talk about a number of others later in the talk. But this is a company called Proteus Biomedical. They make a one cubic millimeter device that goes inside a pill. 
You take the pill, it goes into your stomach. When it hits your stomach acid, it sends a tiny signal to a patch that's on your skin. And the patch, which has a battery, then relays that signal to your cell phone or to another mobile device. What this does is it gives a precise reading on when you took your pills. Now, for most of us in this room, that's not so hard to do. I mean, we remember to take our pills. But for some of the less compliant patient populations, this turns out to be a very, very important thing. So what this shows is that the application of this kind of information technology can change the way we do medicine. It can also change many other things in, in the way we interact with the world. But in medicine, we can have much more customized information about this specific patient. So this technology has been rolled out in placebo pills to enforce compliance of, uh, of you know, when you take your drugs. But ultimately, it will have sensors in it for pH, for temperature, for other aspects of your body's uh, chemistry that will tell the doctor some important things. So because these devices are small and cheap and ultra low power, they're able to accomplish this task that we could never do before. Now another interesting thing about this is that this device has no battery. It has an anode and a cathode, and it uses your digestive juices as the electrolyte. The signal is really small, so it doesn't need much power. And it turns out there were advantages in terms of weight and other uh, aspects to not having an actual battery in the device. So this is just one example of several that I'll talk about here. But I want to step back a little bit and tell you how I got interested in this area. I started doing work on the energy efficiency of computing in the mid-1990s. Uh, in recent years, I've been focused on trying to understand if there were long-term trends in the energy efficiency of computing. And so with some colleagues at Intel and Microsoft and Carnegie Mellon, we published a, a journal article in 2011 that documented those trends. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we came to those results, and then I'll describe the implications for the technologies of interest to this crowd here. The, the bottom line result, let me start with that. The energy efficiency of computing has doubled roughly every year and a half for the past 60 plus years. So longer than Moore's Law, it started with vacuum tube computers. This is an inherent characteristic of information technology that uses electrons for switching. So we'll step back a little more and quickly review Moore's Law, because there's often confusion about it. Uh, it's related to this, this set of trends, at least for the semiconductor devices. So Moore's Law is not a law in the physical sense. It's an empirical observation about components per chip. In 1965, Gordon Moore uh, noticed that uh, the number of components you could fit on a chip economically was doubling roughly every year or so. In 1975, he revisited that and showed that it was a doubling roughly every couple of years. And that rate of change in density of components has held more or less true for the last 30 plus years. Now, this law, if you will, is a way of characterizing the economics of chip production. It's not characterizing physical limits. It's often imprecisely cited. There are a lot of misconceptions about it. So for example, when you, when you say Moore's Law, people say, well, that means performance of computers doubles every year and a half. Well, that's true, but Moore never talked about performance. He talked about components on a chip. There's a great article by Mollick in 2006, for any of you who are interested in the history there. Now this is the original graph in the 1965 article. And for each year, that each line is a snapshot of the economics of designing chips in terms of density. On the y-axis is the relative manufacturing cost per component. On the x-axis is the number of components per integrated circuit. The minima at each, in each year is the point at which you do the production. And the trend in the minima over time gives you what came to be known as Moore's Law. Now, this is the familiar graph of transistors per chip. We've seen this many times. Uh, this is uh, doubling time about 1.8 years from 1971 to 2006. So the question is, how do you measure the energy efficiency of computation if you want to uh, have a consistent time series? And if you get 10 computer scientists in a room, you get 100 different uh, ways of measuring the performance, right? 
And then, of course, there's the added complexity of measuring the energy consumption of the devices. So the, the metric that I settled on for looking at these long-term trends is computations per kilowatt hour. And the way I defined it for purposes of the analysis was the number of computations that a computing device could do at full computing load, running flat out for one hour, divided by the number of kilowatt hours that device would use uh, over that same hour. So it's a measure of peak performance and energy use. It doesn't say anything about idle mode. It doesn't say anything about other aspects that are important, of course, for these mobile devices. But it's a, it's a way of measuring efficiency that is consistent. And we can do it across many different devices. Uh, there's, there's been some historical work on performance. Uh, Bill Nordhaus at Yale, he's the dean of the climate economist, but he's also an aficionado of uh, the history of computing. He did a wonderful historical analysis of performance and costs for computers going back many, uh, many years. And so he had already worked out a lot of these uh, issues of a systematic way of assessing performance. In essence, he defined a set of operations, standard operations for these computers, and then figured out how much time each computer would take, historical computer would take to perform those operations. So that's where we got the performance data for this analysis. Uh, when I had other computers that were not in his database, I uh, normalized to, to the benchmarks used by Nordhaus. On the energy side, I wanted to rely only on measured data. So I had to throw out a lot of data points on performance when I didn't have the, the power numbers. Uh, so there are some old documents that actually describe measurements of the uh, computers in the 50s and 60s. This work by White was funded by the awful Office of Naval Research. And that was back in the day when you can actually count the number of computers that existed in a precise way. There were dozens or hundreds. And uh, I also visited uh, Microsoft computer archives as well as uh, other sources of older computers. The Microsoft archives uh, have uh, temperature control, humidity control, and they have all of these old computers, original 128K Mac, original IBM PC, Osborne, a bunch of other computers that uh, some of you probably have seen. In general, the focus is on having the computer being fully utilized. And when there were portables, there are only a few in the data set, uh, we subtracted out the screen power. So this is what I call the popular interpretation of Moore's Law, doubling time for performance per computer in the PC era about every year and a half. That turns out to be true. And if you look at Nordhaus's data uh, with our additional data added in, you can see that. But this trend has continued for a very, very long time since the early days of computing. Now, how many of you know what this computer is? Any? Altair 8800. So this is the first personal computer. It was a kit computer. It appeared on the cover of Popular Electronics in the mid-1970s, sold in the tens of thousands. Uh, it looks a lot different than what we're used to, but this is just one example of the computers that I actually measured their power use of. The power use of. Uh, this is from uh, Eric Klein, who's a local. He's in the uh, San Jose area, who's an aficionado of uh, old computers, and he has a bunch of them in his garage. He was gracious enough to show them to me. So <clears throat> the bottom line results from the analysis was that uh, the energy efficiency of computing has doubled roughly every year and a half since the 1940s. That means a hundredfold improvement every decade. And that trend enabled the existence of laptops and smartphones. So this trend in the, in the performance has been instrumental in bringing you all into this room today. So for the statistics geeks, the R squared is very good, 0 0.98, 0 0.97 uh, for PCs. Uh, for, for all computers over the whole analysis period, doubling time for efficiency, about 1.6 years. For PCs, it's about 1.5 years. For vacuum tubes, it's, it's a bit faster, 1.35 years. Then there's a big jump from the tubes to the transistors. And uh, what we find is that there was a huge uh, jump in innovation in the late 50s. In a few year period, you saw actually a, a two order of magnitude or more improvement in the efficiency of computing. Part of that was the shift to transistors. Part of it was innovation, using the new characteristics of the transistors to do a whole lot better with performance. 
So the implications here, the things you do to improve performance also almost invariably improve computations per kilowatt hour. So for transistors, that means they're smaller. That means there's a shorter distance from the source to the drain. There are fewer electrons in the transistor, so lower power per transistor. For tubes, it's a similar story. You make them smaller, they have lower capacitance, and they have lower currents. The trends that I've described make mobile and uh, distributed computing ever more feasible. So for a device that has a fixed computing load, a fixed need for computing, the amount of battery you need goes down by a factor of 100 every 10 years. And that has a huge impact on what is possible for distributed computing. Here's one example. This is installed base of personal computers and laptops. And what you see here is uh, big growth in laptops. What it doesn't show is that in 2009, according to IDC's data, the laptops actually outsold desktops for the first time worldwide. And what we're seeing now, of course, as, you're, as you see the penetration of uh, uh, these Ultrabooks and the, the, the tablet computers, is that those are eating up the market share of the, of the desktops and laptops even faster than the laptops ate up the desktop share. So big shifts happening because of these trends. Now it's, of course, not just about computing efficiency. So there are, the, the key lesson here is that low power is much more important than high efficiency. You can create a device that's very low power that, in technical terms, is not as efficient as some other device. But as long as it accomplishes the goal and delivers the value that we need at low cost, then that's completely fine. Now, the revolution that I'm focused on here is being driven by a confluence of trends. I think that the efficiency of the, of the peak performance of the computing is important, but also there's efficiency improvements in communication. There's improvements in the efficiency of sensors. So the movement to MEMS devices is having a huge effect on our ability to use sensors in various forms, and also uh, low power and more efficient controls. In order to enable more of these mobile devices and distributed computing applications, we need, of course, better storage. Batteries have been getting better, much more slowly than computers, but still getting better. And then there's been progress in energy harvesting. We're kind of at the early stages of our ability to harvest those ambient energy flows. But it's something we can see is going to be very, very important going forward. In most of these devices, as you all know, the idle modes are actually more important than the active modes. And this graph kind of summarizes that. It's familiar to most of you. It shows the different ways that you can improve energy efficiency of a device. So it's not just about reducing that active power. That's important. That's, that's something we should focus on. But you can also reduce the active task time. So that means if you shift to a 32-bit processor, a faster processor, then you can shift that you can reduce that active task time and it's going to make a big difference in the total energy use. You can also reduce the standby power, you can reduce the transition time to go from idle to active and back again. So those are the kind of levers you have to do something with this. And the goal, of course, is to minimize the area under that curve. This is a very different goal than if you're designing the fastest personal computer. So here's an example. This is from Freescale. Semiconductor, it's a, it's a race that they conducted among four different uh, microcontrollers. Each of them had the same amount of battery storage to start with. And some of them have lower active power. But uh, this particular device that they, that they demonstrated is a very fast processor. It has low transition time and is able to use the available power much more efficiently and last longer than the other devices. So minimizing the area under the curve for these kind of applications is, of course, a critical thing to do. So this is, I'm going to show you, I'm showing you here some work in progress. So this is not final data, but it's something I'm in the midst of compiling. And it's interesting because it's a focus on cell phones. One of my friends at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Stephen Lanzanzara, had the brilliant idea that if we knew the capacity of a battery for a cell phone, the voltage of that battery, and the talk time, we could have a measure of efficiency of the cell phone. And that's a very simple way to do it. Uh, and it's actually data that you can get, assuming that you have a 
smart young researcher who's willing to go to Motorola and dig into the archives and look at all these websites, which I happen to have. Uh, so we've compiled thus far about 500 data on 500 phones, going back to the first uh, cell phone in 1984, it's a Motorola, uh, and then uh, over time we've been able to collect more and more different, uh, different kinds of data. But what you see over time here, if you look just at 2011, 2012, and you find the median of those data points. This is the efficiency here is measured in minutes of talk time per watt hour of energy use. So if you look at just the median in 2011, 2012, compared to that first cell phone in 1984, you're seeing a growth in efficiency of about 8% per year. That's a little faster rate of growth than a doubling time of every 10 years. Um, it's still growth, and there's plenty of reasons to believe we have uh, a lot more potential for improving the efficiency of communications. Chris Piester at Dust uh, Networks told me a month or so ago that he thought that the efficiency of these uh, modes in terms of transmission and uh, receiving had improved by a factor of 10 over 10 years. So different kinds of devices, of course, are improving at different rates, but that we are seeing improvements in the mobile phone efficiency. So here's an example of what becomes possible when you have ultra-low power computing, ultra-low power communications. This is the uh, Big Belly Trash Compactor. Now this would typically be purchased by uh, Department of Parks and Recreation or a hotel or some other institution that has uh, trash cans outside. And what's the biggest cost related to trash? What do you think? Picking it up, of course. So what this device does is it's, it's self-powered. It's got a photovoltaic panel on top. It compacts the trash five times. So that reduces the number of truck trips, but it also sends a text message when it's full. So just by sending a few bits of information, you're able to much more efficiently route your trucks. So you're moving bits instead of moving atoms. And that, of course, has a huge effect on your costs and on your environmental impacts. So this, is, this technology is a way, uh, when they designed this, they actually look at the whole system and said, how can we change the system by starting from scratch, clean slate, uh, integrated design. And by figuring out a way to have fewer truck trips, they have designed a system that's much, much lower cost than what came before. So this is an economic and environmental home run. Here's an example of ultra-low power sensors from Josh Smith at the University of Washington. I visited these guys uh, a couple months ago. And these are sensors that use 60 microwatts on average. So very, very low power devices. And in a major metropolitan area, this is low power enough that they could, in principle, get the energy they need from scavenging stray radio and TV signals. Now you have to be in a metropolitan area where there's a bunch of big transmitters, but still, this is, you can imagine what, what could be possible here. If you no longer need batteries, you can imagine sensors that run indefinitely without outside power. And that's a hugely important possibility. Many other possible sources of energy as well, but the, the radio and TV signals is the one that I find most intriguing. Here's another example from the University of Michigan. This is what they call their micro moat. This is another one cubic millimeter device. The one I showed you from the University of Washington is, is a little bit bigger than that. Uh, this is a really tiny one. And uh, this one uses a, an ARM M0 core. And it's much lower power even than the University of Washington device. So in, st in standby mode, uh, it's 11 nanowatts. In active mode, it's 40 microwatts. So assuming it doesn't have to turn on and off very much, you can imagine very low power from, from this device. Another interesting aspect of this is that for a device that small, packaging becomes a really important thing. It's no longer just innovation on the chip, but you have to think about how are you going to get a battery or an energy harvesting technology that fits on such a small device and delivers the service that you need. Uh, your MEMS device may not be compatible with your uh, other silicon, so you have to figure out different ways to, to package these layers. And so the innovation is not just about the silicon or the, 
the semiconductor. It's actually about packaging. It's about integrated design. It's how about the whole system. So here's a, a picture of that compared to a penny. And here's one example of a possible application, monitoring the pressure of a tumor. So you can imagine tiny devices like this being placed next to a tumor so that you can figure out how fast it's growing. Potentially revolutionary application for, uh, for medicine. Here's another example, street line networks. So this is uh, another case where they looked at a whole system and they said, how can we make the system better by uh, clever use of electronics? And what they've done is they have uh, sensors in parking spaces. And these sensors are connected via a mesh network. And they send the information up to the, the cloud. It allows you then, as a person looking for parking, not to have to drive around the city over and over and over again. And we don't have good data on exactly how much traffic is caused by that, but it's a non-trivial fraction of the, the total miles traveled within a city. And the surprising thing is, is uh, the amount of power that these modes use is actually very, very low in the aggregate, even for a big city. So for Los Angeles, uh, each mode uses about 400 microwatts, a little bit less. And for Los Angeles, with about 40,000 parking spots, that's 15 watts of electricity use. Now, these are battery-powered devices, so, and the batteries last for three to five years. Uh, so this, what this allows you to do, then, is deliver a variety of different services that you couldn't deliver before. So not only do you, do you make it possible for people to find parking efficiently, but you can actually give them a coupon for the, the uh, cafe that's right in front of uh, where they just parked. So this is their application. It shows you where you can park. It shows you actually the cost, so you can find a place that might be cheaper, and you don't have to drive nearly so much to find parking in the city. Now this is an example of something they haven't implemented in, in full yet, but you can imagine it being a useful thing. Even if you don't have your cell phone and your app, if you have dynamic parking signs that say, parking this way, parking that way, parking this way, you could actually uh, affect the amount of driving that people do, even if they're not participating in the, in the use of, of the app. So this is another example, again, where we've moved bits instead of moving atoms. And that can have a huge effect on the total cost of the system and the environmental impacts from the system. So that's one of the, the big implications of this, is that we need to figure out clever ways to apply our electronics so that we're taking a small amount of information and avoiding taking actions that would waste a huge amount of energy and move by moving a lot of atoms in the form of trucks or cars or some other devices around. Now, Everyone talks about big data, but my, my friend at MIT, Eric Benyolson, he likes to talk about nano data. This is data that's focused on individual transactions or people or institutions. And this is data that gives you a fine-grained level of understanding of what's actually happening in the world. And so that's what these technologies allow us to do. Customize data collection that's precisely targeted on individual transactions on pe individual people as well as on institutions. It will, these technologies will give us ever more precise control of processes. We'll be better able to respond to what's happening in the real world. And we'll have better ways to do real-time analysis because again, having more disaggregated data as well as having computing that allows us to take those data and do something with it will give us this uh, ability to understand what's happening in a way that we never could before. And these technologies, of course, are enabling the Internet of Things. So you could imagine uh, each of the devices in this room, the lights, the exit signs, even the seats, having sensors that could deliver useful information that can also allow us to uh, improve the way we deliver various services. So the bottom line here is these technologies will allow us to better match energy services demanded with those supplied, will give us better real-time control and better uh, analysis of what's actually happening as it happens. So people always ask on the computing efficiency work, how far can these trends continue? And I plotted here the same summary chart 
uh, as I showed before. And then I looked at some work that Richard Feynman, the physicist, did back in 1985. He calculated a theoret what he called a theoretical limit. He said, let's assume that we can make an atom made of three transistors. I will use my quantum mechanical wizardry to figure out how much, how efficient that device would be and compare it to where we are now. So I, I, I used his numbers and plotted it on this graph. And if, if the trend continued as it has for the last 60 plus years, it would take us about to 2041, so about three decades. So this is an interesting result to me because what it shows is that sometime in the next few decades, we're going to have to fundamentally change the way we do compute. Now, you always hear people talk about the end of Moore's law. Usually, though, that discussion is predicated on our existing technology and the limitations of it. So that's fine. We do have limitations. We do have need to understand those. But this is looking at the problem slightly differently. It's saying, here's where we think our limit is, and this shows us how far we, we can still run, assuming we get ever more clever. And I assume that the people in this room are actually just as clever or more clever than the people decades before us. So we'll, we'll continue on this path for a little while. Uh, the question is then, is there anything beyond what Feynman calculated? Now recently, the uh, researchers at Purdue, the university, not the chicken company, and the University of New South Wales recently created a reliable one atom transistor. Now, it operates at liquid helium temperatures, but it uses electrons, electron energy states for switching. So this is what I mean by coming up with a radically new way of doing computing. There's other ways of doing quantum computing that will also potentially have big effects. But the point is, we're going to have to change what we're doing at least for the things that are pushing the limits of, of our current technology. So sometime in the next few decades, it's pretty clear that's what's going to happen. So there are a lot of unanswered questions from this work. One is, is there some way that we could do better than historical trends? If there's some new breakthrough, like IBM just announced in the last week or two, some work on carbon nanotubes that they expect will actually lead to significantly faster computing in about 10 years' time. So those kind of innovations can have discontinuous effects on these trends. There's no God-given reason why it has to go at every year, you know, the efficiency has to double every year and a half. If we come up with some new innovation, it could have a, a huge effect. We could also do worse. If we can't figure out ways to get around these issues of leakage and uh, various other aspects of really small scale semiconductors, then we're gonna have to slow things down a little bit. And then what other things are on the horizon as we approach these theoretical limits? So what I'm going to do, uh, I'll summarize now, and then I'll leave us plenty of time for questions. Uh, in terms of the, the quantitative results from the historical analysis, the, in the PC era, performance per computer and computations per kilowatt hour doubled roughly every year and a half. And that trend has held true actually since ENIAC, so the mid-1940s, so longer than Moore's Law. The things you do to improve performance also almost invariably improve efficiency. So these things are inextricably linked when you're looking at this, this measure of active power efficiency. We're still far from the theoretical limits. And remember also that this, this analysis of the long-term trends doesn't say anything about cleverness in reducing idle power or cleverness in, in reducing this, the uh, amount of time the device is active. So there's other ways we can improve efficiency beyond just the, uh, the standard way that we've done historically. The biggest implications, as I've described, of these trends is for mobile technologies. And what they mean, what they imply, basically, is that for every, uh, every decade or so, we've had about a hundredfold improvement. If that trend continues, uh, that means a hundredfold smaller battery life for uh, tasks that involve a constant computing capacity. And the last point is that this is, I think, the most exciting area of technology right now. Because we're, we're developing new innovations by focusing our integrated design expertise on these low power systems. And by, by allowing ourselves to use these low power systems in new ways, redesigning whole systems to reduce the car traffic or reduce uh, traffic 
from trucks or to change the way we do medicine, we can have radically uh, powerful effects on the way that we interact with the world. And so this is a very exciting time. I think this is a really important area. And I'm glad to be amongst this uh, company of people with such a high do to talk ratio. So with that, uh, I will be happy to take questions. Let me just say one more thing. I'm actively compiling examples of technologies and business models that are enabled by the, the trends in the efficiency of computing, not just the active power efficiency, but also cleverness in standby power and other aspects. So if any of you have good stories, good anecdotes that you want to share, please come and find me. I will be here uh, through the mid-afternoon or so, and I would be very happy to hear from each and every one of you. So with that, I will take questions. So there are microphones in a couple of these aisleways here. If anyone has a question, yeah. please signal. Here's, here's one here. Oh, we got, we got. Um, Peter Clark from EE Times. Um, I'd be interested in your opinion on whether the rate at which we are scaling power efficiency is exceeding or falling behind the rate at which we are rolling out more and more electronics devices to more and more people around the world. Is it a, is it a, are, are we winning or are we gradually building up our planet? Okay, so, so the, the question relates to total power used by these devices as opposed to power <laughs> used per device. So what you're seeing is a shift. You're seeing, there are a bunch of devices, kind of general purpose computing devices like desktop computers that have been the prevalent form of computing for a while. But what you're starting to see is a shift in terms of end users towards devices that are mobile. There are devices that are battery powered. So those are much more efficient than these general purpose devices. These uh, personal devices are, in many cases, specifically designed for certain tasks. So they can be much more efficient, even beyond the fact that they're battery powered. There's much more efficiency when you have a specific purpose device. So a lot of these devices that are proliferating are ultra low power. So a, a cell phone you know, uses a few watts on average right, over the course of the year. Not very much compared to a PC. And so uh, you also seeing at the same time a shift towards computing into the cloud. And so you're, in, the, in the data center world, there are two big areas of uh, types of data centers. There's a kind of, there's cloud computers, and then there are computing devices, and then there's uh, the, what I call the in-house data centers. In general, those in-house data centers are much less efficient than the cloud data centers. So, so you've got this shift happening where, because mainly for economic value reasons, people are moving more towards mobile battery-powered devices and more towards cloud computing, which is much more efficient. And so the, right now, total electricity used by data centers is about 1.3% for the world, about 2% for the US. And back in, in, uh, in th there hasn't been good comprehensive analysis of total power use uh, for a while, since about 2000. But back then, total power use for all electronics was about 3% of US electricity. And so it, it's, you're seeing more devices, but they're much more efficient. And so I'd be very surprised if the, if the total power use exceeded in the US 5 or 6%. That would be including everything, data centers, all that stuff. So we're definitely, improve, we're definitely improving efficiency. We're perhaps increasing modestly the actual amount. But the important thing to keep in mind is what that five, say 5% 5 of electricity use allows you to do for the other 95% of the electricity and all the other fuels. So the, the examples here are this, the parking example and the, and the garbage can example. As you know, a little bit of electricity here can actually help you save a huge amount of energy in other parts of the economy. Sorry, long-winded answer. I'm K.R.S. Murthy, very good presentation, Professor. Uh, in addition to efficiency uh, and energy efficiency and performance, uh, error rates are going to be more important going forward. And uh, there are a variety of error rates that you are obviously familiar with for various reasons. And uh, also from a definitive computing of what we are today, it could become a statistical computing because of when you start talking about 
transistors, file management, and so on. And any comments on that would be appreciated. So one of the things that uh, is happening in computer science now is that there are the realization that we're approaching these physical limits. And one of the areas of getting around those physical limits is to change the way we do computing. So the big, the big shift, of course, was to multiple cores and parallelism. So that's one big shift. But there's now uh, some, some people doing work on approximate computing. So if you, are, uh, if you are doing programming, you're able to say, here's a piece of data that can be approximately right. It might be a photograph or something else. And so you can actually, by, by specifying a new kind of data that could be approximate, you could actually reduce computing load significantly. So there's, there's work going on at University of Washington. Yeah. Lewis says is doing that, uh, among others. Yeah. And so this is a, it's just a really important area because if you're, we're no longer looking at performance and efficiency improvements as hardware problems. These are system problems. And so we're starting to look again at the way we do computing, the tasks that we're trying to perform, and by going towards approximate computing, in this case, we're able to reduce the amount of computation we need and improve our net performance, if you will. Thank you. There's one in the back there and one up here. Hello, uh, Shai from the Embedded Microprocessor Consortium. Um, embedded Benchmarking. Um, I have two questions. One is your metric is efficiency in terms of a compute workload over a period of time. So how do you ensure that compute workload is the same uh, for all of the devices that you measure on? And the other one, considering that you're operating under full load, but you're saying that idle power and transition are very important, how, how does that metric take that into account? So the, the second question, that metric doesn't take that into account at all. And so that's why we need energy metrics that deal with actual tasks. So I, I chose this particular metric because that was the only way I was going to be able to get a long-term consistent trend. People had already done this work on systematizing the benchmarks. In answer to your first question, the people who did that work came up with a set of representative operations. And those, that set of representative operations was then applied to the various historical computers using the, the techniques that they, more people who are more clever about software than I uh, developed. But the idea is simply that there's a set of operations that is constant across these uh, different computers and that that allows you then to get a more or less consistent benchmark over time. Now, the important thing to note is that in actual use, a device may display very different characteristics than what it would do on this benchmark. And that's not accounted for. Uh, but it's forgetting the broad sweep of history, having this set of representative operations, uh, I think, is, a, is an accurate, gives you an accurate picture of the trends over time. There's one over here. Oh, one over here. Uh, at the risk of uh, being overly broad, if you could talk about Frank Frankowski's work at Facebook, who was really trying to, to reinvent the CPU architectures, the power distribution, basically everything in a large scale data center. Now, are you, are you focused on the open compute initiative? He, he open it? compute, open cabinet. <clears throat> he seems to be just taking everything in the data center. Right, so, so this, is, this is, uh, falls under the rubric of the open compute uh, project or open compute initiative. And this is something that's been pushed by Facebook, but it's run by an independent organization now. And there's a huge number of companies involved in it. And I think it's important because the way that technologies have evolved in the data center has not led always to the most efficient outcome. And there are good institutional reasons for that. In these in-house data centers, almost always the facilities budget and the, and the IT budget are separate. So there's no incentive for the IT folks to specify efficient hardware because the savings don't accrue to their budget. But what the, what the, uh, the open compute folks are doing is they're putting engineering talent behind whole system integrated design, looking fresh again at the way that servers are designed, at the way racks are designed. And that, I think, can have a dramatic impact on the efficiency of data centers. So I, I applaud what they're doing. I was at the Open Compute Conference in San Antonio 
uh, in May, and it's you know there's a lot of exciting work going on there. Mike presenting with Camp Marketing. Thank you, Doctor, for an excellent presentation. With the uh, cost price efficiencies of traditional scaling at the trailing edge of the CMOS cost curve again entering appliance, applied science, the realm of applied sciences, are perhaps uh, the economic efficiencies of computing uh, about to be masked or are perhaps not as great or are there uh, elements of uh, competing econom economic efficiencies as we finish our ability to scale to the infinite. Okay, so let me just see if I can rephrase this to make sure I, I'm getting it. So there's this general problem, Denard scaling ended in the early 2000s. And this is the, the way that we were able to keep performance and efficiency improving and density improving so much. And what they did in response, so Denard scaling means that you keep shrinking the this transistors, you also reduce the voltage. And those two things together allow you to keep improving the efficiency and performance at comparable rates. Now, when that ended, because of some of these physical limits, they had to come up with new ways of dealing with that problem. And the, the immediate thing that they did was multiple cores. So we moved towards this uh, parallelism. And that created an interesting situation, because suddenly, for performance, the software people mattered. And this wasn't true for a long time. For a long time, people just said, well, we'll just, you know, our, our code isn't so important because in, in a year and a half, the processor is going to be twice as good. But now there's, there's onus on the software for the first time. But there's these other things, including approximate computing, that people are starting to explore as a way to get past this roadblock. And of course, people are focused on the hardware side as well. They're looking at carbon nanotubes, they're looking at uh, quantum computing, other fundamental changes to the way we do our, our computing. But we're, we're, kind of, we're at this interesting time in computer science where they're facing this big set of roadblocks. They're related to power constraints. They're also related to the fact that we're, you know, we have now wires that are a few <coughs> atoms across. And that's creating all sorts of issues. So, I, so I, I, the general response to your question is, there's a set of challenges related to scaling. People are working on them, but we don't have a clear path ahead. It's not immediately obvious what the next step is. Do you believe that economic benefits are being masked by cost price? To oh, okay. So economic benefits to the broader society from computing, no, right? No, so, no. so thus far, because of parallelism, we've been able to keep going up till now in terms of the performance improvements. <coughs> What I think you're seeing also, though, is the shift towards mobile devices changes the equation. Because the economic benefits from just having a faster processor are not the same as the economic benefits that come from having really inexpensive, widely distributed computing that isn't fast at all. And so what I think is happening, you're going to get a broadening of these technologies that, and we're not going to be as, I, I'm assuming that the, the clever people at IBM and all the other, Intel and other places will continue to figure out ways to improve the hardware, but the big trend to me is more the distribu distributed computing. These low power, cheap devices that get spread everywhere. That's not dependent, the economic benefits from that are not dependent on the pushing the cutting edge of the, of the chips. And so it's really important to separate those applications when you're thinking about the economic benefits. So you talk about uh, the trend towards the moving the bits around, right? And so if we do it where you're moving bits around, the current way you're building the data centers, does it seem intuitive in terms of moving from the in house data centers to the large cloud centers? Because if you're moving bits around, it seems more intuitive where the data centers need to be distributed and local. Okay, so, so the question you're asking relates to centralizing data centers versus having more distributed data centers. And it, it's a balance because certain kinds of applications, it makes sense. Particularly if you're not sending that much data over the network, it's, it's, you can imagine situations where you need a fast response time. So having local, closer computing is better. But it's going to be very application specific. And 
in many cases, the, the cloud computing facilities have advantages that the, that the smaller in-house facilities just can't match. And so they can do, the in-house facilities can do a lot better. But so so the, the question you're asking relates to the choice of where the computing happens. And I think it's going to be very dependent on the individual application and what the latency needs are. So I, I don't think that you can say something, I don't think you can make a general statement I think you have to be very specific about the application, but in the data center world, there's definitely going to be this movement more towards these, these cloud-based facilities. You mean how we do computing in the data center? Yeah. Well, we're, we're pretty far from, from optimal there, so there's a lot of efficiency improvements yet to yet to come there. And a lot of those efficiency improvements actually relate to institutional changes. So even though in these facilities that we think of as kind of the, the paradigm of high-tech virtue, there's huge inefficiencies related to people problems and institutional problems like facilities and IT having separate budgets. So if we fix those problems, which are generally not in the purview of the data center folks, but are in the purview of the C-level CEO, level executives, if you fix those problems, then a lot of these efficiency issues in the data center get fixed pretty fast. So we have just one and a half more minutes, so. Stuart Jeffrey, um, fascinating talk. Question, in terms of your looking at the long-term trends, have you mapped into it how biological systems might fit in? I'm thinking, for example, of the navigation system of an ant and the energy efficiency of that. <laughs> You know, I haven't. Uh, at, when I was at University of Washington, they suggested I plot the human brain yeah. on here. Yes. yes. Okay. So, I, if you have a paper about the ant navigation system, I'm happy to learn about it. But I haven't. It's not something I've thought of. Aside from the brain example, all my friends who are uh, brain experts said you can't do that. But my friends who are physicists said, sure, we can do that. <laughs> So I, that's one of the things I have on my agenda is to see how the brain fits. But come, come to me after the talk and let's let's learn about ants. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick question. I think someone who hasn't asked one yet. This, there's one here. <laughs> I'm a futurist like you are. Uh, I want to bring in one more item that you did not cover. It's called utilization. Utilization efficiency rather than just efficiency, especially when there is distributed computing of all kinds from biosensor networks and so on and so forth. <coughs> familiar? Maybe one word. Okay, so one. this is utilization, very important point. Yeah. In data centers, in in house data centers, typical utilization is 5 to 15%. Yeah. Terrible, awful, needs fixing, right? But here's the interesting thing if you have a lot of cheap computers, utilization becomes less important. If your server is high, you know, costs you several thousand dollars and the, there's all this backup equipment and everything else, utilization really kills you. But if your device is super cheap, utilization is not as big an issue. And so, so I think that that's part of the thing here is in the cases where it matters, we need to really focus on utilization, change the institutional incentives so that uh, the utilization is improved. But for these things that are really cheap and low power, we don't have to worry so much. Okay, so I think I'm over time, but thank you all for your time. Thank you, Jonathan, for an uh, excellent and insightful talk. And from the, judging by the Q&A, uh, this definitely resonated with you. So we're going to move on to our, our final uh, keynote of the morning and talk about uh, uh, mobile devices.